talking, but it's uh, it's quarter two, so um, we should probably get the show on the road. Um, Boundary, so people on, uh, online, yeah. Uh, my name is Dan Hardy, and it's my pleasure and privilege to accept them all the people that we've got in the workshop are so competent and professional that I'm not going to need to do anything. Um, so uh, you can welcome Sarah Knight and Hannah Ethan, who are going to lead this workshop based on the report that you've got in front of you. If anyone's not got one, if you stick your hand up for now, I'll bring one over to you um, and enjoy the workshop. Welcome, Sarah and Helen. Thank you very much, Suzanne and Michelle. And as you'll see, we have also got two colleagues who are also named on the slide that aren't in the workshop today, but we do need to, to recognise their work as well, which we will do. That's Sheila McNeil and uh, Elizabeth Newell. So thank you so much for making it on a really warm afternoon, on a really packed day, and we're really excited that you're able to join us today. We are going to make you work, I'm afraid, but hopefully in an enjoyable way. We have got some activities planned, um, but we want to give you a bit of an overview around the work that we've been doing at GISC over the past year. And some of you in the room have been very much part of that work through our advisory group, through events we've been running. Um, and you know, it's a way of also recognizing the contributions that we've had from the sector. So we're going to give a little bit of context in relation to where we are post pandemic and I think that's a theme that's been picked up in quite a few of the sessions that we've been hearing over the past two days and where we are with learning and curriculum design. Um, we're going to be introducing and I think this is a really exciting bit because it's hot off the press the beyond blended report and materials that you've got on your tables and uh, we have also got a QR code on the back of the postcard if you want to download an um, electronic version of that as well. Um, we're going to be looking at uh, some of the materials from this work which relate to some of the key concepts in that guide in really looking at ways in which we can move our practice forward with thinking about the ways in which we are designing uh, post-pandemic learning. And you have got an opportunity as well in the group activities to discuss and share. So please do make a note of the URL that's on the screen at the moment, because that's the one that we are going to be using today in the workshop. So take a, a, a photograph of that. We will have it on as well when we go through uh, into the activity section as well. A minute for that. So where does this work come from? Um, for us, and you know, I'm showing my age here, but I've been at just nearly 20 years and worked with Helen for a large proportion of that time, um, as well as Sheila McNeil. And uh, during that time, we have always had an interest and a focus on curriculum and learning design. And I can see people in the room who've been involved in some of that early work and those projects. Um, we had led a, quite a large change programme back in 2008, where we funded projects to look at organisational change in relation to curriculum design. And it's been interesting, I think, for us both to, to reflect back on some of the lessons from that programme, some of which are still absolutely relevant today. Um, but also to look at where we are now and some of the differences that are coming to the fore. Um, we produced a wide variety of guides and I think again you know recognizing the work that the alt community played and has played over that time as well in moving forward this agenda and this discussion um, and that really led us post pandemic to thinking actually we need to review where we are now with learning and curriculum design particularly thinking more about ways we can more effectively ensure that we are designing learning that does better meet the requirements and expectations of our students coming in. So in phase one, um, which we conducted last year, we ran uh, a survey, we did a desk review, we had some in-depth interviews, and that guide is available, that report is available um, on the GISC website, we can tweet some link, link, links to that. Um, but that was really important for us to say, well, where are we now? What is the current state of play? And also to pick up on all the excellent practice that is going on in the sector, but also to look at some of those challenges and where some of the differences lie where we are now to, to pre-pandemic. That then allowed us to think about ways in which we could take that work forward, to think about what support and what materials could make a difference both at a curriculum level, but also thinking back to that larger transformation change agenda 
where we do need to be having a more strategic look at the spaces, the places that we're working in, the ways in which we are planning our assessment and curriculum design. And that's the work that Helen is going to uh, talk through with us today. But I think also just to recognise the consultation, the uh, involvement that we've had with the community around these areas of work, as you'll see there. So at that point, I'm going to hand over to Helen, who's going to talk us through the next set of materials. And you should be plugged in. Yeah, I'm in. I'm in. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there's such a wealth of experience in the room, actually. It's quite daunting. So although we've set this up very much as a workshop with a chance to go and look at the resources, um, at the end of this sort of introductory bit, I think it would be good to stop for some questions, maybe just to see some challenges, you know, we're always welcome to that before we go and look at the resources, because there's not going to be long in an hour to cover everything that we've that we've developed, but there is a chance to go and um, get a taste for them and hopefully, hopefully come back with a, an appetite for more or with some some thoughts about it. So out of the first phase of this of this project and Sheila McNeil my colleague very much led on this phase we use these two definitions and it's very much not to impose them on the sector it's really just to describe the ways we found these terms being used by the sector that curriculum design seems to be used very much for those kind of formal organizational processes that might have some kind of committee based structure they produce a lot of documentation um, they define uh, the, the, they define the graduate out outcomes. They might be mapped to other kinds of organisational agenda. And learning design is often used to think about how students will learn within that curriculum structure in terms of activities, materials, assignments, um, environments that might be used. But in all in practice, those two processes are iterative and uh, they are interrelated to one another. So we use this term curriculum and learning design to sort of reflect both that iterative nature of it and the, the lack of, I guess, uh, you know, certainty about which is being used. So we talk about the whole process of curriculum and learning design, designing a course of study, thinking about how students will learn within it. And part of the reason for working in this space, I think, going back to the theme that I feel was set with the keynotes and various other sessions today, is to have a common vocabulary. And the gap that Sheila and I felt we were working in was very much the gap between um, curriculum teams and practicing academics and the strategic thinking around things like place, place design, platform design, timetabling, workload modeling. But of course, if we find the right vocabulary to bridge that gap, we also hope we might find a vocabulary to bridge the gap with students and how students talk about their learning. So as we go through, I think it'd be interesting just to think about how some of the terms that we're suggesting, and, and we're not alone in suggesting, because there's been parallel work that the QAA have been doing, that Advanced HE have been doing. If there are some terms we might use that might also help students to get involved more deeply in the conversation and also in a while I'll show you some visual resources that we really think have got a lot of potential to be used with students for them to describe in visual ways the times and spaces that they feel they occupy in the curriculum. So in the report we don't so much talk about the pandemic shift as the pandemic push because so many things on the left side of this slide were happening already unevenly uh, differently in different institutions, in different parts of the institution, but definitely there was already a shift to thinking about, for example, not just activities and resources being digital in the curriculum, but what if the whole curriculum or whole parts of the curriculum were delivered online, were delivered in a hybrid space. Um, there was definitely a shift from thinking about um, digital media and resources as something that we produced discreetly, maybe with some support, to thinking about everything we do just as now being recorded. So every single thing that happens potentially in a learning space, whether it's officially as I'm being recorded now or unofficially as a student might be making their own notes and records, could emerge from that space, could, could kind of be distributed, could have a new life in another space, a distributed space or in another time as a student was reviewing it. So that was already happening, but the pandemic gave a big push to some of these moves. Um, the move from thinking just about our own productivity tools being digital to thinking about our collaboration tools, our collaborative environments being digital. 
Um, and in terms of learning, teaching and assessment, you know, that move from how do we embed technology, which is certainly the terminology we were using five, 10 years ago, to how do we change pedagogy to be more blended, more hybrid, more flexible, more digitally inclusive, more post-digital even. And this bit of thinking about new sessions, I think that came through very much from some of those student voices that um, we heard at the beginning and also from Peter Bryant's session, if some of you were in there, that students are kind of asking questions like, well, what is a lecture? What is a seminar? Why don't I get more time in, a, in an immersive space? Why don't I get more tutorials that could be online? You know, what is this hour that I have to spend here when I could be there? And thinking about those sessions, perhaps uh, in a more diverse way. We can't stand up with JISC on our badges without mentioning the transformation framework. And this is where we mention it, um, that you've heard from Sarah earlier about that, if you came to that session. But in terms of the organizational transformation, we're thinking about a push from integrating platforms to whole space, place, and even timetable redesign. How many of you feel that at your institution, there is new thinking about what the purpose of a space is, if we have? online access to it, some nodding going on. So there's rethinking about space. I think rethinking about the phrase we keep coming up with, what does it mean to be at university or college? It right? could mean something very different from what it seemed to mean pre-pandemic. And of course, there've always been students who had a very transitory experience of being at university or college, but so many of our students and so many of us and our staff went through that experience, that suddenly being in a place, being at a place, on the one hand, it has a new value, a new set of values for us. On the other hand, we can always choose not to be there. And so we need to rethink as campuses, as institutions, what do our spaces mean to our students? What could they mean? How could they be different? And that's very different from thinking about mm, how do we bring these learning platforms into an existing university college, which we know what it looks like. It's on the front of our prospectus, there it is. And I think, you know, also we're thinking about then support moving from embedding particular technologies to thinking about the whole pedagogy of online. Of course, we all went through an amazing process of rethinking and upskilling there. But how much of that do we want to consolidate and hang on to? You know, how much of that is in risk perhaps of being lost um, or forgotten about in a rush back to a more embodied and on-campus experience? So I think the first kind of message that came out for us of the phase one and phase two work was that all learning we could imagine is at least potentially blended, that there are diverse spaces and places of learning taking place that um, when learners are in one place, they might be having a conversation that extends into another space, um, that there are collaborative environments, which in an interesting way can be used live, a bit like some of the environments we've been using today, you can use them live and that's very responsive and immediate and engaging, but then the trace can be carried forward to another time, time of review, or maybe you did the preparation in that space and then when you come together, it's to think about what that preparation means in a more responsive way. And not, there's a lot of talk about how space is reconfigured by digital, isn't there? But I think there's less talk about how time is changed by digital, by those ubiquitous recordings that students can access pre-lecture, post-lecture, speeded up to twice times if my teenagers are anything to go by, stopped and started, how time is changed by having those collaborative environments and documents that can move with us from a preparatory phase of learning to a live phase when there's that excitement of getting in there together, seeing other people's cursors moving around and their anonymous rabbit over here. And then, you know, the kind of more reflective space where we go and look back in the same environment at, at what, what happened. And I think all of that means that learners have this new power to make choices, to connect learning, to, to participate, to not participate, but to also connect to make new conversations for themselves, to make new groups for themselves. And again, that's something that the students were saying, wasn't it? Well, why can't we have different WhatsApp groups that do a lot of this thing that you want us to come on campus to do? Learners are very often in transit, you know, in this cost of living crisis, maybe not every learner can come onto campus as much as they might want to. Perhaps they're accessing learning, you know, as they cross borders for some of our students or as they get into town for others of our students, or as they don't get into town because they can't afford to get into town. So there's a lot of learning in transit and in transition, um, which means that technology can allow for some of those transitions to happen that wouldn't have been possible, but also creates new vulnerabilities, doesn't it? Because some of our learners may be in transit, 
while others might be securely located. So what we're thinking about in this idea that all learning is blended is that when we design a program or a session even, we need to be paying attention to space and place, to time and pace, as well as some of the more traditional learning design issues like media, resources, tools, environments, groupings, as resources we can deploy. The resources we have as a university were massively resourced in all of those things, but also resources that students might be choosing to deploy or not to deploy. And if we can meet them, then we can persuade them that spending the right sort of time and place with us might be worth doing. And engagement really runs throughout this idea of time and place as resources. Now, Sheila being a wonderful um, visual um, communicator, Sheila's done some great posters, and then when we get to the online um, workshop, you can have a look at some more of them that express some of this much better than I've just done it with words, really. So um, there's a, a number of posters that think about where am I, where am I in, for example, in, in a live lecture on campus, something a bit like this space. And I don't ex know exactly where all of you are right now. Some of you I can see are here with me, which is lovely. Hello. Some of you may be uh, doing other things, you know, which may be entirely relevant, maybe for you relevant. They may be the sorts of distraction you need to keep focused, you know. We could have brought in Sheila. Sadly, we can't because she's doing a workshop somewhere else um, from another space to talk to you. We could have brought in other stakeholder voices here to this space. You might be uh, going in a minute, you will, to a Padlet to go and do something relevant to what we're doing here. So being in this space is a much broader, more diverse experience you're not all having the same experience that perhaps five ten years ago you'd all have been having the same experience i could rely on you having the same experience of being in this room together it's not exactly the same and i think this poster and we're finding ways of um, developing versions of these posters that we can then work with students to get them to express what it's like for them to be in place or not in place in platform and the different ways that they coordinate things into place what about time you know i mentioned that we could reconfigure time um this is a learning journey in time and it's the journey in time of a lecture recording so maybe you know you come from a, a, an institution where there's a lot of preparatory work you may have put your slides up online first so students are already doing some work to prepare them for this lecture to think ahead about what's going to come up in the lecture and then there's a time when the lecture actually happens and hopefully it's really dynamic and interactive and they're doing some of those different things we've talked about and then there's the time after the lecture when they can take that lecture and they can create learning time for themselves that they wouldn't otherwise have had because they have access to that recording because they can bend and shape it to their own needs, to their own revision, to their own uh, lack of understanding, to they have, you know, we've come across students having watch parties together, like, you know, let's get together and look at that lecture again, you know, because there was bits of it we really need to revise together and have a chat about. Or what about the collaborative design board, something like a Padlet? What's the journey of that in time? You know, the board you're going to go and look at has a prehistory. We did uh, eight workshops. We had about 700 participants in total. Some of the traces of those workshops remain in that Padlet, um, although we always take them out and respectfully write them up afterwards. Um, you will go and hopefully interact in that Padlet with each other, with the resources that are there, and then that Padlet will continue to have since in time for you. You can go and find all these links that Sarah's told you about. We can go and see what you said and create new learning for us all from it. So I'm going to get into a couple of um, things that have numbers attached to them because they always make for good um, outcomes. You always have to have numbers of things and then you can create a nice visual and then people hopefully remember it. Uh, we had a long look at what we are talking about when we're talking about this blend with the view that blended, flexible, hybrid, these are all really nice aspirational words, but they don't really tell anybody what is going to happen in this session? You know, what's going to happen in my curriculum? OK, it's a blended curriculum. Which bits of it are actually going to be helpful for me for learning from? And actually, I went all the way back to um, Rona Sharp and Greg Benfield did a review of blended learning way back in 2006, which really blended meant media. Blended meant, oh, there's this thing called online uh, resources that you might be using as well as your traditional resources. And that was what blended meant. Now we're thinking more about these blends of place. So are we in place or in a platform or in a place that has a platform embedded in some kind of immersive space? We're thinking about time, which has always been there. We've always had live study time and independent study time. That is the nature of post-16 education that, you know, that we 
that we want students to become more capable of studying in their own time, but we've got these new ways of bending, blending and shaping time. And I think one of the things we all learned in lockdown was that students like different pace paces of learning that for some students the live experience which is very responsive very sociable they miss that terribly they couldn't get motivated online whereas there were there were some students for whom actually some of that live learning had been quite overwhelming which maybe we hadn't seen those students very clearly and when they had more reflective time they were more engaged because they were able to think they were able to slow things down they were able to look at what was expected of them in a slower time frame then we still think about media and about how groups and interactions can be coordinated around all of that. So we took the first two of those, the time, pace and place issues, and they kind of arranged themselves nicely into a quadrant. And what was really nice was that a team at Advance HE, K, K at Advance HE had brought a team together to think about exactly the same issue. What is it we're talking about when we talk about different modes of participating? And they've come up with all very, very similar um, ways of talking about it. So obviously we've got the, the live online, which we're familiar with um, from the pandemic and post pandemic, you know, being in a video webinar type environment with audio, video, chat, maybe um, other kinds of resources, uh, polling. We've got live in place, which might have all kinds of material resources, it might be a lab session, it might be um, in place because we want live exchanges to happen. We've got asynchronous online and asynchronous in place. And interestingly, the Advance HE uh, report puts asynchronous online and in place sort of together because you can see why, because if it's your time, you can decide where you are. But one of the things the cost of living crisis has really highlighted is that a lot of students don't have a good place to be, to be doing their online that they're independent learning. And there's a new sense that the campus has to be a place where students can find themselves in place, you know, services they need, a sense of belonging, a sense that they're supported while doing quote, independent study. So it's not enough just to say, well, it's independent study, you know where you wanna be, that's fine. We actually really need to think about the campus as a place where students have to find a place even when they're not required to be in a place at the same time as other people and that's why we had these these this this separation in these four modes i'm nearly there to the bit that you get to do some stuff so that's all sort of quite high level and when we went out to talk to people you know we really had conversations about well what's it like to design what's it like to actually design either a program or a session or an activity when there are these options available and especially how do we engage learners because we know that learner engagement given that there's all this choice you know you'd think that this choice would create a, a kind of massive amount of engagement but actually it's had the opposite effect having a lot of choice has created a crisis of engagement along with other things it's not only that and what what we were hearing is that we need to focus on what are the high value space time place pace combinations that students will commit to that they will be engaged with it may not be the same answer for every student it certainly won't be for the same discipline of every discipline the same we need ways of describing that and when you begin to drill down into our workshop materials you'll find that we've started to attempt to describe some of the value of different session types and spaces that that um, we were hearing that hopefully focus very much on engagement they were saying we need to see time and place as resources in a new way. So instead of like, well, we have the campus, that's kind of obvious, and we have timetabling and we have room bookings, and that's all just given to us. So when we start design, we've got 12 sessions and they're going to be in this room and we've got an hour a week. Actually thinking about those as resources that we need to deploy in, in new ways. And we need to have that conversation in a pedagogic way. Like we need to be able to explain why it doesn't suit this group of students or this course or this particular dis discipline or topic to have those 12 sessions in the same place. But some of them might want to be flexibly online. Some of them might need to be on site. Some of them might need to be in a different place with different materials. Of course, those conversations have always happened, but it's finding a vocabulary to explain why student engagement really critically means why do I need to be in this place? with these people at this time when I might not be, I might be engaging differently. We know that as educators, we have to actively manage pace and presence. And a lot of educators I talk to have taken that insight from their online teaching experience 
back into the classroom have realized how they use their body and their voice and their position and their movement around the class and their relationship with eye contact with students that they were missing and have really committed to developing their pace and presence live as well as online and i think that's a really exciting opportunity for us as educators to think about and to understand the trade-offs so when we get onto our six pillars we've got pillars around flexibility but that doesn't mean that every element of every curriculum should be as flexible as possible it means that there are trade-offs for flexibility you know trade-offs like coherence trade-offs like the cohort effect being on the same page with your with your peers as you move through the curriculum and you know finally we need to obviously make this very local what works for you what works for your students will be different to what works for other students student groups and those issues about responsive versus reflective time that I mentioned versus structured versus open-ended um you know what the different rules are of these different spaces need to be taken into account so where we've arrived at and if I'm clever I can oh there you go falls open in the middle um just gives a good graphic but actually I quite like this graphic for this for this um this set of principles we um distilled from those conversations that feedback those those um many many participants who spoke to us we distilled what we've called the six pillars and they're pillars rather than principles because i'm sure every single one of you already has principles for curriculum design at your institution you know don't have learning design frameworks you use you know don't have graduate attributes so this is not to replace any of that it's just to give a another perhaps uh, way of thinking about those decisions you're already making and the top three are called place platform and pace so it's thinking about the blend of of obviously in place learning with online learning and how that interacts with the pace you want students to be learning at, you know, and need them to be learning at, and what choices they could have about pace. And then when you're combining those, the bottom ones are about blend, flex and support. So blend is that going back to that slide and that discussion about all learning is blended, potentially, but what parts of the blend are going to work for this student cohort? what flexibility is useful for students to have again not all not all parts of the curriculum need to be maximally flexible there's often a case for parts of the curriculum being very structured perhaps in place because we need to see everybody having this experience together maybe it's a very high value discursive experience maybe it's a site visit maybe it's a really important um concept that we're all going to address together through an experimental method or through going and collecting some data and finally, all of this needs support, you know, doing all of this is different, it's difficult, it's not what we used to do for our staff, but for our students. Workload modelling needs to be aligned with the reality that, you know, some of this takes a lot of preparation before and after, it needs to be aligned with um, the fact that not all of teaching may be in contact, it may not all be in place and live, and that requires workload modelling managing pace and presence is something staff really want to learn how to do better after the pandemic that takes resources students want to know how to connect all this up and they've got the technology to do it but do they know how to use the technology to make their own pathways through these resources of time and space and place they're being offered so we're going to we were going to go to activities to go and have a look at those but i'm really happy to take five minutes first to sarah if you want to come up and just if people have any thoughts or any questions it's been a high level gallop through if you have any thoughts any questions any contributions we're doing it like this how does that fit in please let's take five to do that before we go and actually look at the resources You're all st stunned after lunch in the AGM or needing your pickup of tea and coffee. Sorry, yeah. I think we need a mic for the thanks, sir, for the. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much, Helen. Really interesting. Um, I, I was having a discussion with Dave White earlier on and came up with a reflection after the student panel that quite often students have a certain perception of learning that teaching is learning rather than learning is learning as we might broadly understand it um 
not quite sure if this is a question, but do you think students get designed learning or could? Well, I think student expectation is part of um, what we need to work with, isn't it? So students come to university college with a series of expectations about what that culturally will look like. And some of that is quite helpful, actually, because it means it feels, you know, there are things we can work with in that. And some of it is really unhelpful. Like if I'm not sitting in a lecture being lectured at, I'm not properly being taught. And I think this kind of vocabulary around where am I going to be and why am I going to be there? And is that going to be in my own time? Is it going to be, you know, students are used to having a lot of flexibility around how they devote their own time. And a lot of students need that because they have part time jobs, they have caring responsibilities, they're in transit. So how do we persuade students that when we have them together in a space, in a life space on campus, that is worth their time? Now, some of that happens because they value the lecture. Whatever we say about lectures being rubbish, students continue to think lectures are the real deal. But we can use that as a positive thing, like because students tend to think getting lots of people together in a room is going to be good. And we can use that as a motivating thing. But I think we have to have that conversation right from the beginning. And some of that might look like, I mean, I've seen a brilliant um, graphical curriculum. Don't know if some of the rest of you saw it on the thing that used to be called Twitter going around just before this conference. You know, the, the, the way we talk to students about what's going to happen in the curriculum doesn't have to be a 14 page document about, you know, learning outcomes. It could be some of the sorts of things that were on those, um, you know, visual bursts of like, well, when you're in a live lecture on this course, here are some of the things that are going to go on. Boom, 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 boom. You know, when you're in a lab, here are some of the resources you're going to build yourself that you can build into your own timeline of learning. You can take away and build them into however you choose to learn with them, you know, whatever note capture you use, whatever AI you're using behind the scenes. So I think just having the, the conversation with students about what the curriculum looks like, literally looks like, is going to be quite important part of what could come out of this. Does that- Design plays a, quite a big role. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, exactly. It's the aesthetics. Yeah, planning. <laughs> yeah, the aesthetics of course design, exactly. And I think that's something that we've picked up over the years with all our student research, isn't it, Helen, that students always say, we actually want staff to be a bit more explicit about the role that technology is going to play or, or why we are doing the things that we're doing. So, you know, going back to that student panel this morning, a lot of those um, experiences from students, if they had had that support or things were a bit more explicit, rather than us as staff thinking they're explicit to students, may then help students to understand what is expected of them and how that learning is going to take place. And also the choices that are open to them. You know, I think, you know, when we design a curriculum, we want some flex, we want to build in a certain amount of flexibility. And, you know, how flexible do we want it to be possible for staff to be? Like, you know, I've programmed in for there to be a lecture at this hour every week. Nobody's turning up. Have I got the flexibility to turn that on its head and do something different with that hour that I've got for that I've got in the timetable? just as we want that some flexibility for students. Like I've got an hour, two hours to devote to this course this morning. What's the most productive thing I could do with those two hours right now? You know, we want to be able to answer that question because time and space are resources for students as well as for the curriculum. Cool. Should we do, should we go to some activities? Yeah. Because I think time we need to, we need to go on. So uh, hopefully you've gone, most of you've gone to this, this space here. And there's lots to explore there, but what we'd like you to use as resources, since we are in this high value with incredible colleagues around you, really high value space, genuinely, um, we'd really love for you to go and have a look at the six pillars in the light of the things I've said about them, and possibly the four modes as well. And just have that conversation about terminology, you know, hybrid, high flex, flexible, uh, blended, you know, do, do, do some of the terms that we are using here, will they land OK? Or, or is it too late to change the terminology where you are? Is this a helpful way of thinking about curriculum design? If you can add anything to the Padlet, that's great. But we'll also, since we are live, do a bit of live feedback in kind of eight minutes or so, five or eight minutes. So hopefully you will enjoy.
Have you got access if you're looking for it? My edgy room is really weak in here. Yeah, yeah so well, the, the six pillars are in this column here. So if you click on any of those, but yeah, it's loading really slowly. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Edgy room seems to be really weak in this room. I apologize, it's loading so slowly. And main, yeah, mainly it's what's in here. And um, yes, so some of those prompts you could also have access. I mean, there's a lot more on there, but this is. I'm 
Yes, I've been talking those types of things. Just water, just water. Yeah, please. Once for me, once for Sarah. So I think we'll have one more minute, one more minute, and then a little bit of feedback. One minute. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. One more minute. We're going to just have one more minute to go. Your session types does that, which is online, which we'll look at next right. session. No, 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 it's, you're absolutely right. We've tried using the term responsive time yes. and reflective time. Like responsive time is when you're live together yeah, with yeah. people and reflective time is when you're on your own. Because that, but not everybody likes that. The thing about asynchronous, it's synchronous, it's very technical and people go, you know, no, yeah. I agree. Or live and independent. That's the other possibility. Yeah. That's how I do it. Yeah. Well, synchronous is now. Once we do it all together, it must wait more. Next week is asynchronous, whether we're online or not. But that's how I've always explained it. And I know it's really sort of like. No, we need that. And like to participation, but again, just the morning weather. There is a, and I slightly positive, but it is kind of like the same thing. It's in the phone and it's in the same place. Yeah. Yeah. If you guys would look in the next activity, if you would go and look at session types mapped to the four modes and see if that makes it any clearer, that would be really useful feedback. I'm not saying we shouldn't do the glossaries because I totally agree, but I think it would be really helpful to know whether when you get examples, it looks a bit clearer. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. So think we'll move them on first and then we'll do feedback at the end. So I can hear what was what is known as wide ranging conversations happening, which is usually time to try and bring people back together a little bit. Um, some of the questions that a few people at some tables have had uh, might be answered if we went straight into the next bit and then did some feedback at the end, because some of the other resources we've got do go more deeply into real kind of real examples, particularly around well, what do different sessions look like if you think about them this way. So if it's okay with you, we'll go, I mean, if you're ready to move on, and if you're not, that's fine. If you're ready to move on to something else, you'll see there's two further columns to the right. One of them has got a series of what we've called lenses, curriculum lenses and strategic lenses. And hopefully this is where the so what about the six pillars comes in. So the six pillars are looked at through a series of curriculum design lenses, like what does this look like when we're thinking about student capability, when we're thinking about student engagement, when we're thinking about assessment. There's also some strategic pillars, lenses of which there could have been about 20 after our workshops, you know, we had, but there are some kind of core strategic pillars as well. So you could go and have a look at that way of accessing the six pillars and give us some feedback. Or you could go further onto the workshop resources, which include um, kind of what is the value of live online of the four modes like what is the actual educational value and there's also a series of session types which looks at the session types in the different modes like why you might run a live lecture as opposed to an online one why you might give students a task to do together live as opposed to in their own time so either i would suggest because of the time we've got either look at one of the two lenses strategic or curriculum or go and look at those other workshop resources right at the second last column and then when we get back, hopefully they'll, the feedback will be having had the benefit of seeing that slightly more detailed view, as well as the high level view. Does that sound sensible? Great. So we'll have a few more minutes to look at the more detailed stuff, and then it'd be great to have your feedback and questions at the end. That makes sense, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. What do you think? Yeah. We're going to come up and do questions, and I'll run around with this. I'll run around with this. You can take different words. You can do some feedback. Yes, my dear. Yeah. Are they in here? No. They're all, it's all online. So, so, yeah, can you? So these. I think it's edgy because I can see it fine, but that's because I'm all my it's preloaded on my computer. Yeah, that's no, it's because I checked it earlier when I felt there, so it's all preloaded. Oh, yeah. some other people seem to be online fine. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not look like over there. Ah, that, that, yeah. Oh, there we go. That just opens it in a new tab. That's where. It they are in the report i'm an idiot they are in the report oh. yeah um it's my stupidity there Big oh, part. Yeah. So I don't know what's in my end report. It's before the double page spread with the six pillars on it. The, no, the other side of that double page spread. But I mean, you know, I don't know how much it adds to the. 
How are you doing? What is it we do? you can't move you, you, you can't move yes absolutely absolutely that high flex is really i mean one of the things we say in in here is high flex is really problematic because those because those have their own you know there's their own interactive potentials cultures and if you try and combine them and as an educator you're trying to meet needs in two different ways aren't you you're trying to meet the embodied needs of people in the room and so what's what nice nice you're not meeting anyone's needs i mean i think this is why we have this didn't use the term affordance could so easily have done martin was on my shoulder we did this thing about you know what are the why would you do in place or online though and you know since they're different you just jam them together it's not going to work or you're going to need to double up your teaching resource so that you can exactly both exactly exactly well, that's good to know. You could say that thing about high flex when we do feedback. It's a nice one. If you could bear uh, yeah. or about them being inverse versus each other. <laughs> Right. Shall we shall we have a little bit of discussion time? Should we make time for a little whole group discussion? Great conversation, Helen. That's good. 
it's right shall we just gather some feedback yes let's have some thoughts it's it's great that the um small group conversations are, are so active but it'd be lovely to use this large space with so much expertise in it just to share a few high level thoughts so we're not going to stretch this at all you know anyone who feels moved to say whatever and feel free go on tim Thanks. So I'm just picking up on the last point. Earlier we discussed what is learning, which was quite philosophical. But on the last point, which is more practical, uh, relating to the four quadrants of the modes of learning, um, we think that the asynchronous bottom line needs to be better defined um, because Asynchronous in place in particular is a mode that is wide, widely used in normal learning. For example, it, it just means, in my view, um, that students need to go to a probably university provided location in order to study. That could be the library, that could be artist studios, that could be laboratories, where, which they book independently, computer pool rooms and so on, all resources that they don't have access unless it's university provided. So um, in, in terms of these places, uh, if, if you look at the online domain, we are very happy to say, distinguish between synchronous and asynchronous. But I think the thinking needs to be the same for exactly. the physical spaces in the university because they can be used synchronously and they can be used asynchronously. So I think the asynchronous aspect probably needs the, the firmer definition but exactly why we like and actually it's elsewhere we say that a large amount of equity the, the equity inequity issue can be talked yeah. about in that space because it's the students who need you know a lot of those spaces the university is providing for all students what otherwise you might assume like a private study space or you know access to to books and resources or computer time you know some of it is specialist but I think the university needs to think about the general spaces it provides as well for, so yeah, great. And it could, you know, please write, do some resources around that. That would be wonderful. Yeah, great. Well, but students could be deciding to be together in place, couldn't yeah. they? Which would be synchronous. Would they be taking the advantage of the, capacity to be together which those a, those in place things can also provide it doesn't have to be timetable but i agree it's usually timetable i just wanted to add just following on from that is that when i read that those two the the async online and in place are we thinking that that's a student on their own or is that students in groups doing things so when i hear, see, read that word independent There'll be lots of students that may have to do a group task for, say, a problem-based learning situation that they've got to prepare it before they come to the live in place. But they may do that as an async and one group decides we're going to meet on Friday afternoon and have pizza while another group might decide let's meet on campus. So that seems to me more around like one learner on their own, but that just might be my interpretation. And the other thing is why not sync online and sync in place? Was that ever talked about? We had the conversation about so sync and async are difficult terms and we tried lots of varieties so live independent would have been a pair sync async would have been a pair um i quite like reactive responsive reflective as a pair but it's a bit too edgy speak there isn't really a great pair but live async was the one that most people said they recognized mm -hmm. sorry to the person who said async no <laughs> knew what it meant but I, I do think that, so if you go back to um, the blend, you know, clearly you can have a whole range of interactions going on, you know, solo learning, informal group learning, formal group learning, highly structured role-based learning in all four modes. It's just that some of those modes we tend to use in different ways. And I guess that's why we, you know, we tried to suggest that classic learning design does quite a lot of this. Whereas we were trying to think about the bit that classic learning design perhaps has not paid so much attention to, which is time and space as resources. Um, because yeah, you could, you could, you could map 
formal and informal you know onto those and it would almost match but not quite because some of this is shifting partly because of technology well thank you for this I, I think this is enormously useful and what i like about the that quadrant diagram is is the simplicity of it and the clarity so i can see that the discussions that have just been had about the asynchronous online and in place but i think for me the real strength is about the live online and the live in place and helping uh, colleagues to understand the appropriateness of those different modes and where they add value and where they they don't and on in your documents on page 26 and 27 there's a really good table about what you know comparing in place and online learning sessions and and you can see that it's almost the corollary of each other and we were just discussing on our table how this really probably lays to rest any argument for the value of what I think we call high flex, where you've got some students in the room and some students online. Because if we accept that those things, that those do two different things, which I, I believe they do, I mean, not everybody will agree with me, but I think that is good. It's a, it's a good uh, tool to help colleagues see that, that, that high, you know, general high flex, I mean, you know, there may be specialist uses of it that are value added you know that sort of idea of having a a, a big lecture theater with some people in it and some people online I just I think this this helps us explain why that's not a great idea <laughs> so thank you well it'd be great if it did that task I mean I guess another way of putting that is that the resources teaching time resources the resources of a teacher are differently allocated when you're teaching live in class and when you're teaching online we all know they're very different experiences and you're allocating your resources of attention and care differently so trying to do both at once you need to double up on teaching resources basically if you want that to work for people so that might be another way of putting the same thing i think we have to come to a close here do you have any close your view much better at closing statements than i am have you got anything to say at the end well just to say thank you so much for the engagement um, that you've you've given us today, especially on such a hot afternoon. This is just the start. Um, although this work has been going on for a year and we've got the report out now, um, we are working on a, a new JISC guide, which will take the resources on the Padlet um, and move them over to our JISC website. Um, all feedback that we're gathering through all these workshops on the Padlet all help shape and inform and enhance the work that, uh, that Helen and Sheila have been doing. So go away, bookmark that, uh, <coughs> that Padlet link. Um, please do, if you are interested in, in hearing more about the guide, um, please do sign up and you'll get advanced notice of, of when that guide's going to be published in the autumn. And please just continue to engage with us. Um, this work is only, is always informed and shaped by yourselves and the community that we work with and we hugely value the input that we've had today our advisory group and others so please continue to discuss engage share uh, get in touch with helen sheila or myself and uh, we'd love to hear your feedback and work with you on developing these further so thank you so much for participating thank you to helen as well and to sheila virtually uh, for all the work that's gone into this Thank so, you. So uh, it remains my final thing to do is just to say thank you very much to Helen and to Sarah. And if you can all show your appreciation before you rush off for a cup of coffee.